Hey, welcome to another edition of Lunch Hour Live. I'm Sue O'Connell here at the Boston Public Library at the Newsfeed Cafe. We're hoping you're having a later lunch with us today, a little 3 p.m. action for you. We're so thrilled to be here live at the Boston Public Library. While you're joining us on the social media, as always, if you have a question for us, just let us know in the comments section. I'm so happy to be joined here today with Kirk Johnson. He is the Sant Director of the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History and host of Polar Extremes, which at some point today I'm going to call Polar, Polar Extremes, Extremes, just because it's going to come out. How are you? Welcome. I'm great. Thanks for having me. What a tremendously fun and exciting and beautiful series. What, what's happening in Polar Extremes? We go both to the high Arctic and to the Antarctic to look back in time, into deep time, and find when the polar regions weren't covered by ice, but they were actually forested. What was the state of the world at the time that you, you're looking at? When you're looking back in time, you're not talking about like 200 years ago. Well, we go back in multiple chunks, but we mainly go back to about 50 million years ago. So the North Atlantic was closed. You could probably walk from Boston to Scandinavia without getting your feet wet. <laughs> and there were no ice caps at all. The sea level was higher. And there were forests as far north as there was land. So we have really weird, different kind of world than today. I want to show a clip and get to it so we can dig in. Yes. That's a little joke for you right but there I'm into fun. this a little bit. This is a clip from Polar Extremes on Nova. Take a look. So we're going we're gonna to get back to a clip in just a second. It's a two-hour special that's premiering on uh, February 5th. What do you bring with you to these extreme locations? Good clothes. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, good clothes. That's it, just good clothes? Well, you know, you go out all day long, and we're way up. Where we went to Ellesmere Island, we were uh, well north of the Arctic Circle, a thousand yeah. miles north of the nearest tree. And we're on an island where it was really hard to get to, and it's really hard to get off of. So if you don't have what you need with you, it's really miserable. So lots and lots and lots of layers. Layers are of, always the key. And what's yeah. your background? What brings you into this, this mix of, of working for, uh, f for the Smithsonian, working in television, working in broadcast, and, and marrying this great love you have of digging with, with television and, and great programming? You know, I'm a paleontologist. I love to dig and find fossils. And fossils are often really visually cool things. So I can show you a fossil and it kind of blows your mind if I can like, look, here's a dinosaur skull or something like that. And I've been working in museums my whole career. And museums are where we communicate science to the public. So I used to talking to kids and grandparents and kids and grandparents together and giving lectures. And I found that talking to an audience that's in front of you is that a whole lot different than doing a cool TV show? And TV gets to so many people. And you can use TV to get to so many places. And Nova took me pretty much wherever I wanted to go on the planet to make this amazing story. Where are some of the places that you go in this series? We went to the top of the Greenland ice cap. We went to Ellesmere Island. We went to the Yukon. We went to the Chukchi Sea in Alaska. I got to climb to the top of the Space Needle in Seattle. We went to wait, Antarctica. Wait, wait, wait. You got to climb to the top of the Space Needle in Seattle? Yeah. How'd that happen? So I grew up in Seattle, and the Space Needle is 605 feet tall, and it's, you know, what it's looked like. It's got yeah. a little needle on top, a little thing. And I learned not that long ago that 18,000 years ago, Seattle, like Boston, was covered by a thick sheet of glacial ice. And when I say thick, I mean 3,000 feet thick. So if the Space Needle is 600 feet tall, there's five Space Needles full of ice, worth, worth of ice when the ice sheet was there. So what they did was they put me on the very tip of the Space Needle and then backed off on a helicopter, made me small, and put in 3,000 feet of ice. How long were you up there? Two hours. <laughs> it was awesome. It was totally awesome. So what, <laughs> were you a daredevil as a kid? Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to classify you as a daredevil, <laughs> but this is a little in the daredevil. Look, as long as I'm roped in, I'm good. <laughs> it's, not, it's not high if you get attached to a rope and a good clip. And I was up there, I was tied in, and I was not going to go anywhere. If I fell, I would just dangled on the top of the Space Needle. All right, let's take a look. We're ready to go, I think, with a clip for you from Polar Extremes on Nova. It debuts on February 5th at 8 p.m. on PBS. Let's take a look at a clip. The Arctic. 
the Antarctic. Our planet's ice worlds, vast, frozen, and empty. Yet hidden in these rocks, buried under the oceans, and trapped in the ice, are clues that reveal a totally different past. Oh my god, look at this! Full of surprises. It's like a whole forest. I'm Kirk Johnson, and I'm headed out on an adventure back in time. Just walking around carrying a mammoth tusk. And around the globe, from one polar extreme to the other, to discover an Earth totally different. It just looks like Mars. From the planet we know today. This place is so totally amazing. An Arctic that was once a warm, humid swamp. Antarctica, full of dinosaurs. In a time when ice sheets extended from pole to pole, turning Earth into a giant snowball. What powerful forces drove the poles to such extremes? And what does it mean for our planet's future? Find out the true power of ice. This is amazing out here. Polar extremes on Nova. I'm speaking with uh, Kirk Johnson here. You're watching us on WGBH on Lunch Hour Live. If you have any questions, please raise your hand if you're here at the Newsfeed Cafe at the Boston Public Library, or just put them in the comments, and we'll get the question to Kirk. It is so phenomenal and awesome to see the images from our planet, right? I mean, you talk about, we've, mm -hmm. we've talked to folks before from, um, from the Nova series. We always talk our, about our planet as like, it's like another world, like it's being on a different planet. But this is our home, right? Oh yeah, I mean, like most people have never been to the really icy parts of the planet. And when you go there, you're blown away by how big the scale is. I mean, Greenland is an ice cap. It's 1,500 miles by 500 miles by two miles thick. It's a giant ice cube, and to stand on top of that thing is such an unusual experience. What was the most dangerous thing you think that you, um, you know, experienced while yeah. you were you were making the series? I don't know. We like, we repelled into one of those moulins and in, in these great ice holes in the middle of the Greenland ice cap in the middle of the night. Um, again, I was tied onto a rope, so. <laughs> Which is your motto. Yeah, if I get a rope on me, I'm good to okay. go. <laughs> um, but I think we did a lot of helicopter flying. We did a lot of helicopter flying over open water and ice. We did a lot of um, small plane flying. So a lot of places where you go where the conditions are pretty marginal. I want to um, get quickly to another clip because I want to ask yeah. you some questions about it. So this is another clip from uh, Polar Extremes on Nova. Many people find it hard to believe that humans are acting as a geologic force, outstripping even volcanoes as a contributor to global climate change. Have you ever thought about how much carbon is in a gallon of gasoline? Let's weigh it and find out. A gallon of gasoline weighs about 6.3 pounds. 87% of that is carbon, and that means there's five pounds of carbon in a gallon of gasoline. Think of that like a five pound bag of charcoal briquettes. When you burn gasoline, you create carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide is an odorless, invisible gas. But think about this. What if the carbon came out of your tailpipe, not as carbon dioxide, but as solid chunks of carbon? Kind of like car turds. So if the average American car gets around 25 miles to the gallon, that means that every 25 miles, you're dumping five pounds of car turds out your tailpipe. The average mileage for each car is about 12,000 miles a year. So that releases over a ton of carbon. In the US, there are a total of about 100 million cars on the road releasing about 330,000 tons of carbon per day. When we include the rest of the world's 1 billion cars, we reach 3 million tons of car turds every day. And that's just cars. When we add in power plants, factories, 
aviation and agriculture, and multiply it by 365, the total carbon released by human activities in a year is a massive 12 and a half billion tons, enough to leave a pile of car turds four miles across and over a mile high. I was struck when I saw this for a number of reasons, but one I was remembering uh, once reading uh, sort of a, a historical piece about when the car, when the auto was introduced, how it was sometimes marketed as a cleaner version than the uh -huh. horse-drawn carriage, right. right? Because horses would leave manure on the streets, and if you had more cars, you would have less manure. Right. And here you so eloquently make the connection that just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Yeah, and I always felt for most people, global warming and carbon is a pretty abstract concept, but everybody pumps gas. So the idea that a gallon of gas gives you five pounds of carbon is a pretty startling fact. How does that go into our world? What does that do? Because it's still invisible to us, right? Yeah, so, but, but carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So mm -hmm. as it comes out your tailpipe, it goes into the atmosphere. And the more there is, the warmer it is on the planet. And we are pumping up so much that we as humans, with our cars and our factories and our heating, are actually changing the world's atmospheric composition in a way that's making the planet warm up. I've always um, been amazed talking to people who have a hard time understanding climate change, mm -hmm. especially when they're holding um, a glass of white wine right by the stem, because they don't want their hand to warm the wine. Oh, that's an interesting right? analogy. But you they heard, have a yeah. hard time understanding how we're impacting mm -hmm. the world with our activities. So you're traveling to a place where you're going back in time to where we were covered in ice. Mm -hmm. You're looking forward to some challenges that we have. What, what lessons do we get from, uh, from polar extremes, from, from where you've been? What we do is we kind of unpack how the world works, how it worked before humans were here, and how it works with humans here. And so we look at the past as a series of lessons or examples. Times in the world is much colder than it is today, and times when it was much warmer than it is today. And then we think, well, I'm just a guy driving a car. How much effect can I have? But next time you're in traffic jam, look at all those cars and think of all the cars around the world and realize that actually humans are, for the first time ever, acting as a geologic scale force. We're part of the Earth system now, and we're pushing it in a specific direction. We also, I think, uh, unlike our predecessors, I mean, I guess this has always been gradually true through time, but we can now see further in the past than oh, our yeah. predecessors, and we can reliably predict the future better, right? Right, and plus the fact that we are changing so fast. I mean, think about the technology that's infused your life in the last few years, the rise of ice smartphones, for instance. There was none in 2006, and now almost everybody on the planet has got one of them. You're a paleontologist. Absolutely. So what role do paleontologists, what, what role uh, is that type of science playing in making changes and making discoveries regarding the climate crisis. You know, paleontology is a, a very fun profession because we can go out and find incredible fossils and there have not been that many paleontologists and there's an awful lot of rocks out there. <laughs> so we're always discovering new things. So we're writing the book of Earth's past on a daily basis by making these discoveries. And I started out being a paleontologist I thought it was a cool thing to do and I was interested in it, but it actually turns out it's quite relevant to today because what we're doing is fleshing in the story of our Earth. And we live on Earth today. Humans are part of the planet. We're just today's chapter in a very long, long book. And insights from the past are really relevant, it turns out, to our immediate future. Like what? Next 30 years, for sure. Yeah. Like, is there, is there just some discovery that we've recently seen, or you've recently discovered, yeah. that is a sort of eureka moment for the future or a game changer for way, the ways that we're behaving? Well, there are two things that I experienced that both show up on the show that were that for me. The first was when I was um, just turned 22 and I went on my first job to Alaska. I worked on a, a research vessel in the Bering Sea. And we got trapped in the sea ice in June. It was like big sheets of sea ice. We couldn't go anywhere in this ship. So I experienced a sort of polar experience. Since then, and that was back in 1982, if you go to that same spot at the same time of year, there's no ice at all. Like the Arctic sea ice, which was very widespread when I was 22 years old, is effectively gone now. And by the, in a few decades, we'll probably have an open Arctic Ocean. And it was last the time that you actually got a new ocean. I mean, think about that. The Arctic Ocean used to be frozen when we were kids, and it's gonna be an ocean before we die. 
So there are global scale things that are happening on our time frame, on our human time and frame. And happening on an accelerated, it'd be one thing if it were, you know, 2,000, 5,000 years, but it's happening yeah. within human lifetimes. And not only that, are there, there are things that are happening now that haven't happened for millions of years. It's not just the glacial cycles we're seeing. We're actually going, every year we go forward, we're going back hundreds of thousands of years to a different, warmer time. The other thing that I, I saw when I was a kid on an early expedition when I was 23 to Arctic Canada were fossil tree trunks way north of the polar circle, of the Arctic Circle. And I'm like, what are these trees doing here? And since they're there, they must have been growing there at one point in time. And we found fossil crocodiles and turtles wow. and wow. snakes in an area today that has polar bears and walruses. So I was like, wow, the Earth really does change dramatically over time. It's the period of time that's the concerning part. Yeah, and, and, and we humans do things fast. Yeah. We don't just stand around, we move. I'm speaking with Kirk Johnson. He's the Sant Director of the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History and the host of Polar Extremes, which you can watch on uh, PBS on February 5th at 8 p.m. You can also go to the website and interact with everything. We hope mm -hmm. that you'll interact with us right now. If you have questions for Kirk, you can send them in your comment section on social media, on Facebook, and on the Twitter machine, or if you're here in person mm -hmm. at the Boston Public Library, just raise your hand and someone will come over and get your question. So the thing I'm, I'm just so fascinated with the series too is just getting all the stuff that you need to do, mm -hmm. the things that you need to do. So I want to go to this next clip just to show some of the heavy machinery. Uh, it's not just, you know, paintbrushes anymore and, and little tiny digging. It's, it's backhoes, right? Yep, all right, let's it. watch another clip from Polar Extremes. There's lots of white crumbly stuff in here. Yeah. Geologist Maureen Ramos studies places like this to try to predict what a warmer climate might have in store. Super cool. They didn't build rock hammers for digging in clay, I'll tell you that much. To find what Maureen's looking for, we need to dig deeper. And my rock hammer just isn't going to cut it. Digging tool of choice? Yeah. Needs a shovel, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to reach a layer of mud that dates back three million years. Can you bring a chunk of that black stuff up on the bottom? We'll just dump it on this side. Just like a little scoop. Oh, yeah. Every oh, geology department thing. should have one. <laughs> thanks to the backhoe, we hit a fossil jackpot. Hey, thanks. That's perfect. That's Look awesome. This. Look at oh. that. There's that perfect three million year old clam right there. Oh man, that could have been like alive yesterday. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, places like this are pretty special for paleontologists. This is great. Yeah. A window to the past. We're on a beach. We're on a beach three million years ago. It's incredible to think that this quarry, 90 miles inland today, was once a beach teeming with corals and other marine life. There was warm ocean water lapping against this shore. Warmer world, warmer fossils, coral reefs. It's amazing. It's right before we slid into the ice ages. It's just solid black mud full of clams. Three million years ago, when the Earth was three or four degrees warmer, the North was mostly ice free. A lot of the water that is now locked up in glaciers was in the ocean which means that the global sea level was about 60 feet higher. According to Marine's calculations, this is how the East Coast would have looked. If Earth continues to warm, the coastline will start moving inland as the ocean returns to places it covered long ago. So where were you when you were doing that? We were at a place near Skippers, Virginia, straight in from Virginia Beach. And it's kind of amazing, with fossils, you can reconstruct ancient worlds. It might be a fossil clams or a beach, fossil trees or a forest. It's not that complicated. Just, <laughs> right. it's, you know, <laughs> kind of simple stuff. <laughs> but when you find a beach that's 60 feet higher and 90 miles further inland, you're like, oh, the beach used to be here. And you date those rocks and it's three million years ago. You say, well, the beach used to be three million years ago. That's telling you about our past and our future. It's, it's also interesting, too, because I, I, you know, I think we all grow up thinking that the world we live in is the world we live in, right? Yeah, and yeah. the things that happened in the past happened so far in the past that they have no impact on us today. 
But it seems like we're growing up, or the, our children and kids are growing up today, knowing that we're in, always in an evolving state, for good yeah. or for bad. I mean, we've learned so many things in the last 30 years about how to read fossils and how to interrogate the Earth about what's happened in the past. And in the show, we go back to a time 700 million years ago when the entire planet was covered in ice. We also go back to a time 56 million years ago where it was so warm that not only were there no ice caps at the poles, but we had subtropical animals up in northern Alaska. So you can get really warm, really cold, and that's all kind of interesting until you apply it to you today because we're changing our climate so rapidly that it suddenly becomes relevant what happened 50 million years ago. Yeah, and somebody in that Virginia beach there that's no longer a beach had a property on the waterfront. That, yeah, that, that's <laughs> no longer it's there. under a lot of water now. <laughs> All right, we're talking with Kirk Johnson. Got a couple of questions from our audience for you. Um, what's the most valuable and most interesting things you've found? Oh, that's I, a big one. I, you know, I think for me, interesting was finding these huge stone forests a thousand miles north of the nearest tree, and in the soil beneath the forest are evidence of crocodiles and turtles and snakes. Here you have a place that in life would have been like the Gulf of Mississippi, you know, Mississippi somewhere down in New mm -hmm. Orleans. But there it was, thousands of miles north, that same ecosystem had moved all the way north, which means that there were no Arctic or Alpine environments at all on the planet. A right. very different world. So when you realize how significant those switches are, it really kind of, bumps your mind pretty hard. Here's another question from our audience. What things do you do as the SANT director of the Natural History Museum? That's a great question. I run the world's largest natural history museum on Washington, D.C., in the mall of Washington, D.C. We get about 5 million visitors a year, which is great. About 85% of those are American tourists who come from around the country. And we have exhibits about the natural world and human cultures. And we've been around in that spot since 1910. Got about 400 scientists every year that are describing new species. About a typical year, we'll describe about 300 new species and write about 700 new scientific papers. And we hold the nation's collection of natural history. We have 146 million objects wow. representing just about anything. We've got the National Squirrel Collection, the National <laughs> Whale Collection. I had no idea we had a Natural Squirrel co Collection. I'll let my dog know because she go. really loves the She'll squirrels. She'll be totally out of her mind. There's 287 <laughs> different kinds of squirrels in the world. Wow. So anything you want to know about the natural world, natural world, we have those objects in that collection. It's sort of the Fort Knox for understanding biodiversity of the planet. And the biodiversity is so important. Why? Look, it's the planet we live on. We live on planet Earth, which is full of plants and animals and microbes, and we're kind of the recent visitors to this landscape. We are of the landscape. But as humans, we're doing lots of things to change the world. We're paving, we're farming, we're chopping forests, we're starting fires, we're polluting the oceans. All of those things impact biodiversity, but it's from biodiversity which comes all of our food, uh -huh. all of our medicine, all of our future security, all the places we like to go, yeah. everything. So we're kind of living in a spot that we're not treating very well right now, and it's important to realize that. And the more things that go extinct, the less things there are to be on the planet and the less things to support our existence. I want to talk a little bit about the, the show itself, about the mm -hmm. series, about the production of Polar Extremes. How much goes into this? Do you, you know, this, this, how many people do you think are involved? How long does it take? How much of your life have you put into this? You know, we got the idea about four years ago, and then there was the first phase of raising money, getting the crew together, and eventually you have the money and the crew and the general idea of the story, and we went on a series of trips, me and a team of about four or five people, and we'd go visit scientists in different locations, so we had to, each one was a little miniature expedition, like we went to the top of Greenland, for instance, so we had to fly to Greenland and then get in helicopters and chopper up and land on these rocky outcrops and wow. camp there and visit the scientists mm -hmm. and then chopper out onto the ice itself, which is definitely the scariest place I went was the top of the Greenland ice cap where the wind was blowing 45 miles an hour and there's crevasses everywhere and water was shooting across the surface and you figured if you get out of the helicopter, you just like down, bye. <laughs> So, none of that. But I mean, they're all these great little trips. I traveled 78 days to make this wow. two hours of television. And then I spent two hours in the studio doing the voiceover, and that was my part. But behind the scenes, yep. there's a huge editing crew that's getting the editing all right and all the work we're putting to get the show together. And it, it's a, a beautiful location, but also making sure it looks beautiful and it's represented the way that it actually is. So and it sounds amazing. right, and we're communicating yep. clearly. And 
So um, what's your leading uh, theory on, uh, on the dinosaur extinction? I just recently was reading, there's this thought, this is not in the program, but I've just, <laughs> now that I happen to have a paleontologist here, exactly. I think I would ask. Exactly. Um, what, that, that there was a, there's a, 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 a blood illness that may have killed them. I mean, are, is, is, is there any new ideas about that? I'm completely fascinated by the idea yeah. of the meteor landing and the dust going up into the sky and the sort of quick extinction that happened on the planet. Uh, what do you think? So in 1979, nobody had any idea what killed the dinosaurs at all. In 1980, the idea that an asteroid caused the extinction was proposed, and there was a big fight that broke out that lasted about nine years. And by 1989, the majority of scientists were pretty convinced that it was the asteroid. And then between 1989 and now, there's been some people saying, well, maybe there are these big lava flows in India. They might have done something. But literally in the last six months, several papers have pretty much confirmed it. Yeah, it was the asteroid. Six mile diameter asteroid going at 20 times the speed of a rifle bullet hits Mexico, makes a hole that's 25 miles deep. Tsunamis that go around the world, magnitude 13 uh -huh. earthquakes, acid rain, skies full of fire. Over a short period of time. Over hours. Right. Hours. Like, the, like we're just talking like the, somebody woke up one morning, a dinosaur woke yeah. up one morning and said it's going to be a good day, and then by the end all of life had basically yeah. been extinct on the it planet. It wasn't just a bad day, it was a bad afternoon. I mean, it was like a horrible <laughs> afternoon, and it probably killed most of the large animals yeah. on the planet, and the things that survived were small burrowing things. Yeah. And that's pretty well set science now that it was the asteroid. And uh, it's, it's an amazing sign. We don't want to have that happen again. No, we don't. And, and part of the work that you do and other scientists do by digging down and looking at the layers and finding what's happened is, is, a, is not just a good look at history, but hopefully giving us signposts moving forward, right? Well, yeah, we had, before that discovery, we had no idea that we should fear asteroids. The, th the thought was that asteroids didn't even hit us because there were not that many craters and we thought they burned up in the atmosphere. But now, now we know they <laughs> not only hit us, but they can ruin the joint. <laughs> what, did, where'd you get that car? Well, the car the was car, loaned to us. The car, a great car that's in yeah, the series we here. We borrowed it from two great car collectors who lived in Sheridan, Wyoming, and they drove it across the mountain to, to uh, where we were on the west side of the mountain in Wyoming, yeah. and they let me drive it around for a day. It was great, great. Kirk Johnson, it was great to meet you. Uh, good luck with everything, and we're so looking forward to Polar Extremes that debuts on February 5th, and of course, folks can get it at PBS and at NOVA and mm -hmm. all that. Enjoy the rest of your time. It's great to see you. Thank you so much. I'm Sue O'Connell. Thanks so much for watching us here at Lunch Hour Live. I uh, want to remind you that tomorrow at 3 p.m., Lunch Hour Live with no pass required, Marcus Samuelson will be here. So come down to the library at the Boston Public Library here at the Newsfeed Cafe, or just go to our website at WGBH at Facebook or at Twitter. And uh, I will see you next week. Make sure you check in every day to see what's new here at Lunch Hour Live. Thanks for watching.